everybody, Mitch back in the saddle for another tech tip here this week. So this week will be a first in a series of tech tips that I've wanted to do for a while, and that is myth busting some of the, the common storage wisdoms that you'll hear uh, throughout the years. So the one that we're gonna look at today is the one that I'm sure anyone that's used ZFS for any amount of time have heard, and that's that you're only gonna get the IOPS of a single drive in a RAID Z VDEV. So is that true? If it is true, what does it look like? And if not, why? And we're gonna show in an actual ZFS configuration, we're gonna show off some really cool things. And we like to do a little bit of a white board or gray board or brown board presentation here as well. So I really wanna dive in on this one. So come on in with me and let's check it out. Okay, so to get to the bottom of this single drive's worth of IOPS in a VDEV, we have to first understand how ZFS does reads and writes. So we have synchronous, we have asynchronous types of writes in ZFS. Now, what is going to be used, async or sync, really depends on the client and how it's going to send its IO requests. However, on the ZFS end, you can actually force either one. You can force sync or force async. Now, what do these mean? Well, asynchronous means when the data comes in, it goes into memory, and as soon as it hits in memory, the acknowledgement goes back to the client, and says, hey, I've finished writing this, even though that isn't strictly true. Synchronous writes, however, actually get committed to what's called the ZFS intent log, which is on disk, and as soon as that happens, the acknowledgement goes out, because that means that the data actually is committed somewhere safe. You can imagine in the case of async writes, if it got into the memory, but then power loss occurred before it flushed to disk, you could potentially have data not there that the client expects to be there when the power comes back up. And those are the main differences. Now for many, many use cases, most use cases on the desktop, asynchronous IO is completely safe and totally fine, especially for ZFS, because ZFS doesn't have the problem of the RAID write hole that they talk about. And what that means is in ZFS, because operations are atomic, you either get the right, it's completely done, or none of it is done. You never get the, the in-between where half of a right gets committed, but the other half doesn't. So when you come back up and the power comes back, you have corruption because you have half committed data that never happens in ZFS. So asynchronous IO is very acceptable for a lot of use cases. Now, if you have very mission critical data in ZFS, that's where synchronous writes probably are going to serve you better, where you know that when the acknowledgement goes out to the client, that it is already committed safely to disk. Okay, so now we understand uh, async and sync. Let's try to see how this works in a ZFS context and if the single IOPS of a VDEV actually holds true. And I think if any one of you have used ZFS for any amount of time, uh, that's a wisdom that we hear, but it doesn't quite jive with what we actually experience when we use ZFS, right? We know for reads for a fact that if we have a random read or even a sequential read, and it's in the arc, the adaptive replacement cache that's in memory, of course we're gonna get way more IOPS than a single drive because we're reading from memory. Now for a random write, or a sequential write, well, we know sequential writes as well. We can get multiple gigabytes a second from a sequential write in ZFS, um, even from a single thread, even from a single VDEV pool. So that doesn't quite jive. And then finally, the random writes, right? This is where you would expect, okay, it's random IO, this would also be an issue. But well, as we're gonna show in a second, random writes actually can outperform what you would ever expect eight, in this case, eight hard drives, a RAID Z2 with eight disks, could ever do with, the, with what you know what a hard drive can do as far as IOPS, let's say 400 IOPS per hard drive on a good day without RAID or without a file system on top of it. So you multiply that by eight, or in this case six, because you take away two for parity, and then you look at what you actually get in your random writes and it doesn't jive. So let's dive in, let's show it, and then I'll really show what's actually happening while we visualize this here. Okay guys, so let me set the stage here of what we are seeing on screen. So in the top left corner, we can see our Z pool status, that our pool has eight drives, its name is Tank, and it's a RAID Z2, single VDEV pool. On the top right corner, this one's just for color and it's nice to see, it's HTOP. We can see all our CPU cores, how much they're in use, and you can see any processes that are running. We're not gonna use this super heavily, but the bottom two we are very, very heavily to understand what's happening. So the bottom left-hand corner, we have a tool called BWMNG. What this lets you do is 
visualize uh, either I.O. on disks or network traffic. We're using the disk module right now. And what I've done is I've specifically added just the disks in our Z pool here because we want to watch how the I.O. goes through the from the pool, from, from the pool layer in the memory all the way to the disks and what it looks like. And in the bottom right corner, we have IOTOP. And IOTOP is only watching for processes that are actively doing IO, nothing else. So this is going to help us really visualize how the Z pool is committing the data in the, in the uh, case of random writes. Okay, before we actually show it off, how would you expect a random write to go? Well, we know that uh, a hard drive, like I said, can only do a few hundred IOPS. So at best, you would expect a Z pool with a single VDEV, especially for going by that single drive's IOPS perspective, you'd expect that in a 4K random write, we wouldn't see much better than 400 IOPS if we're lucky. But we're not actually gonna see that. So let's dive in, we'll run a file, and before I run it, I'll kind of show you what this file is doing. So we have a four kilobyte block size. We have the name, uh, the file name is test rand. We are sitting in the tank directory. So anything we run is gonna be run right on the Z pool. It's a 10 gig file. Uh, we're doing a single queue depth, so a single IO depth. So one 4K write uh, before it queues up. It, has, it doesn't have the ability to queue up a bunch of 4K writes. Uh, it's time based, so I'm going to run it for quite a period of time because I want to talk through what's happening. Uh, we're doing direct I.O. Now, I'll put a pin in that, but direct I.O. doesn't strictly work very well in ZFS because of inherently how ZFS works. Data has to go to memory first because of the transaction groups. So you can't just tell ZFS to completely bypass the memory because that inherently is how ZFS works. So it's there, but it's not really doing much in this case. Um, oh, look, I've got an IO, extra I.O. depth there, so I'm going to remove that one. Okay, so we have a 4K random write test with a single queue depth. So if we were going by what we said, maybe 400 IOPS. So let's run it and let's see what we start to get. So we can see our disk is doing some stuff. We got some transactions. We can see that we're bouncing around between 9,000 IOPS and about five to 4,000 IOPS. Uh, for throughput perspective, that's between 30, uh, 20 to 40 megabytes a second. I would say at the end of this test, it's gonna, uh, end up being about 30 megabytes a second. So around 8,000 8, plus IOPS. Now that's well above what we were talking about, what we were expecting, right? Okay, so why is that? Well, ZFS actually doesn't really have random writes in the strictest sense. ZFS, because it acts very similar to a database, what it's doing is it's taking all of the small 4K writes that are coming in a single 4K at a time, putting it into memory, waiting for a bunch other to come in, and then every so many seconds, in this case we can see it's pretty quick, every five, 10 seconds, it is then flushing that as one large uh, coalesced write. And so let's look at that and, and visualize it here. So we can see our disks are being very bursty. They stop to zero IO completely, and then they burst all the way up to like 200 megabytes a second. So that, jives what we're talking about no io no io then a big flush of what used to be 4k random writes is now turning into large block writes which hard drives are really good at hard drives are great at throughput not so great at iops so because it's taking that random io and making it more of a sequential big flush the hard drives can do what they do best now if we look at the bottom right corner we can see here the file runs and then every every few seconds we get a big transaction sync and that's zfs taking the, the data that's in memory and flushing it as all one big write. So that's how we end up seeing. So from the client perspective, oh, I'm getting 10,000 IOPS. And while that's not actually completely true because we're not really doing it in that many IOPS, we're getting the throughput though. So File thinks it's doing 4K blocks, which it actually is. Then once it gets to ZFS, well, it turns those 4K into much, much larger writes. So they're still getting the same throughput, but, but from ZFS's perspective, you're just writing big chunks of data, which again, hard drives are really, really good at doing that, right? Okay, so that covers why random writes aren't really random when it comes to ZFS in the async realm. Let's see what happens when I turn on sync and let's see if those performance, that performance stays the same. And then once it doesn't, spoiler alert, we'll jump to the board and we'll explain why not. All right, so let's rerun the test. I'm actually gonna increase the number of time because I wanna have enough time to talk here. So let's just go 300 seconds. Again, it's gonna run. Again, it's gonna look very similar as to what we just saw. But now I'm gonna cancel out our HTOP 
And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enable sync always on our ZFS pool, which is gonna turn our asynchronous writes to synchronous writes. And we're gonna see pretty quickly how much our IOPS change from that. So let's go ZFS set sync always and on tank. So it's gonna hang for a few seconds and we're gonna see our IOPS are gonna drop pretty quickly here once it, once it takes it. All right, so we're down to nine. It's gonna increase though. All right, so here we go. Um, we're still at 70, so we'll give it a few more seconds. It's starting to warm up. You, typically, you wouldn't expect to enable sync on the fly as it's running, but look at that. All right, so we're back up about 112, 114 IOPS, which is about what I'd expect, right? We say that a drive can do 400 IOPS, which is strictly true. You're never gonna actually gonna see that once you put some layers on it. But what's actually happening here is our drives are essentially getting hit twice. And let's show what that means. So in a typical pool with async, what we have is this. We've got our pool. So let's say it's made up of a number of disks. And then we have an arc, which is our memory. It sits up front. Now, as the I.O. comes in, it coalesces in here, like we were just showing. Once all that uh, data gets coalesced into the arc, it gets flushed in one big transaction group into the Z pool. And you get really, really good throughput performance while the client thinks it's doing really, really good IOPS. Now, when we enable sync, ZFS is still actually doing this exact same thing. And this is a little bit of a misconception but there's a something called a ZFS intent log. Now you can also do it on a separate device. So by default, once you turn on uh, sync always, what happens is there's an area of your ZFS pool on your disks uh, that is labeled the ZIL, the ZFS intent log. So now what happens is the data is still coming into memory and is still coalescing in these transaction groups, but what also happens at the exact same time is the data also bypasses and goes directly into the ZIL for a commit to say this write is going to happen. And this is to ensure that if power loss ever happened, that we have a run of everything that it was doing when the power went out. The data that hasn't been committed yet, we at least have a journal that's writing exactly what it was going to do. So then when the power comes back on, it can replay its ZIL and see, oh, okay, I was going to write these last writes. So what you can see here is you're writing once here, but you're still, you're not giving up your transaction groups. So the data is still coming in here and then still flushing to your disks. So now you have a double write penalty. And why is it at 100 IOPS? Well, we know that Again, it has to be written to disk, completely finished, and then before the sync goes out. So now the file test from the file perspective, it's not just sending all this data, waiting for it to get to memory. As soon as it hits memory, it gets the acknowledgement, so it looks great. Now it not has to wait for the data to actually get to spinning hard drives. And those are very small writes, which as we know, hard drives are not great at small writes because that means more IOPS for less throughput. So now we can see it's still running. We're, we're stuck at about 100, 102, 112 IOPS, but we can see the same behavior is happening. So those transactions are still happening. We can see it, right? Transactions sync, but the performance is much, much lower because it has to wait for these zills to come in before I can keep writing stuff into the arc. So yes, it can still use the transaction groups and flush them really well, but it's at the mercy of the speed of this. And that's why if we were to do what's called a slog, a separate ZFS int intent log, put it over here on let's say NVMe, our IOPS are now going to jump right back up again. We're not getting that double write penalty. NVMe's are really, really good at small writes. So we can write the, the journal writes here. And then ZFS can continue on doing what it does best taking the data, putting it into the transaction group, flushing it to the hard drives, writing it as one big contiguous write. So that is why these broad terms and broad things that we see, that we say, uh, like you're only gonna get the performance of a single drive in a VDEV is kind of misleading sometimes, right? Especially when you're just learning about ZFS, people will take that at very face value. Now this is true and the, where, where it really comes in to be true at is random reads because we know writes, not the case, random writes, not the case, random writes with, with no dedicated slog, pretty much the case. What about random reads and sequential reads? Anything that hits that arc, well, we know the IOPS are gonna be amazing, but random reads, 
that do not fit in this arc, that aren't in the arc, that is where you're really gonna see that single IOP, single drives IOPS for the performance in ZFS per VDEV. That is where it's really gonna rear its head. Now, ZFS has some pretty good trade-offs, all things considered. If you think about all the different workloads that you could do in ZFS, having that one little workload that is, as long as you build your pool correctly and, and have a really well-made arc, uh, that's not gonna rear its head too often, hopefully. So. Yeah, as long as you build your ZFS pool really, really well, you can still get away with some amazing performance, even with spinning rust. All right, so for those of you that were familiar with ZFS already, hopefully this cleared things up and made it a little better for you. Uh, for those of y'all that have never used ZFS before and this is all new to, hopefully it was easy enough to follow along and, and understand. Uh, but with that being said, that's part one of our Mythbuster series. So we're really excited to keep going with this one. If you have anything specifically you'd like to see us Mythbust in the future, definitely leave a comment down below. We'd love to check those out and we'll definitely take them into consideration. Uh, but with that being said, that's it. I'll see you on the next one.